When the Labour Representation Committee, the forerunner of the Labour Party, was established in 1900, it was an alliance of trade unionists with socialists from organisations like the Independent Labour Party, or ILP, and the Social Democrat Federation. At the founding conference there was a debate about what the nature of the party would be. Would it be an explicitly socialist party, with class struggle as one of its aims? But Keir Hardy, one of the leaders of the ILP, had different ideas, arguing that Labour should have no other isms but Labourism. After the defeat of the general strike in 1926, millions of people looked to Labour and a future Labour government led by Ramsay MacDonald to defend them from exploitation and poverty which was ravaging their communities. But Ramsay MacDonald's government, elected by universal suffrage in 1929, proved to be a bitter disappointment, siding with the bankers and the rich against working people and trade unionists, splitting the Labour Party and going into coalition with the Conservatives for the rest of the 1930s. Some on the Labour left, like Jenny Lee, who was a member of the Independent Labour Party, were very critical. But she didn't think Ramsay MacDonald's actions were just carried out by him alone. She believed the problem was Labourism itself, that there was a problem at the heart of the Labour Party and its politics. She and her comrades in the ILP were considering splitting from the Labour Party. Nye Bevan went to meet her to try and talk her out of it. He said, Why don't you get into a nunnery and be done with it? I tell you it's the Labour Party or nothing. I know all its faults, all its dangers, but it is the party that we have taught millions of working people to look to and regard as their own. In 1951, Nye Bevan and Harold Wilson resigned from Clement Attlee's government in protest at the increasing of NHS charges in order to fund further military expenditure. After losing the next general election, Labour went into opposition for 13 years, during which a battle between the right and left engulfed the party. The Bevanite movement on the left was campaigning for greater party democracy, further nationalisations and opposition to nuclear weapons. But at the 1957 Labour Party conference, Bevan spoke against unilateral nuclear disarmament, siding with the right and demoralising his own supporters. The Labour left learnt a valuable lesson, never put all your faith in one leader. During the early 1970s, Labour was again in opposition. Workers' strikes and protests, occupations of workplaces, raged across the country. A Labour MP known as Tony Benn visited a number of these workers' occupations on picket lines, was incredibly inspired by the class struggle that he saw. A man who had previously been associated with the right of the party began to move left. The Labour left during this time grew in size and significance. The 1974 Labour manifesto promised a fundamental and irreversible shift in the balance of power and wealth from the rich to working people and their families a very radical position for Labour to hold. But the Labour government after 1974 refused to implement the more radical policies, instead implementing cuts and a wage freeze as demanded by the International Monetary Fund. In response, the Labour left, led by people like Tony Benn and the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy, fought for mandatory reselection across the party for MPs, to hold them to account for the membership and to make sure that Labour actually implemented its left-wing policies. The rise of Thatcherism after 1979 saw a concerted attack on post-war social democracy. Taking on local government and the unions, Thatcher sought to move Britain fundamentally further to the right. Unfortunately, this was a position that increasingly the Labour leadership acquiesced to. The Labour left became a scapegoat for the problems facing the party. Labelled the loony left, they were considered too radical, too left-wing, simply too unelectable. As Neil Kinnock waged his battle against the left, he sought to divide them, calling them either soft left, people he could work with, or the hard left who had to be expelled and removed from the party. By the early 1990s, the Labour left had suffered numerous defeats, hollowing out the party, making it far less democratic. This led directly to the rise of a new right around Tony Blair. After years in the political wilderness, the remnants of the Labour left looked like they had little chance when they got Jeremy Corbyn nominated to be leader of the Labour Party after the general election defeat in 2015. But thousands upon thousands of people rallied to his positive message of change, a renewal of social democracy and hope. People who felt abandoned after 40 years of neoliberalism and what was approaching a decade of austerity. Sensing a chance to fight back against the hopeless compromisers, the machine politicians and the careerists, Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party was an opportunity to move the entire national debate to the left. 
Now the debate is how far can the left go? What dangers and what opportunities will face a left Labour government? Most importantly, how can we build a movement that can really challenge the entrenched power of the ruling elites? Now with thousands of young people, trade unionists and community campaigners behind Labour, hoping, fighting for a progressive Labour government, radical alternatives are back on the agenda. Now for the first time in ages, as John McDonnell says, in this party we no longer need to whisper its name, it's called socialism. <laughs>